History Network and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. So you can follow us there. Also, we're broadcasting on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, WFDF. And we're broadcasting on 9, 10 a.m. WFDF's uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook page also. Okay, so on today's show, uh, we're going to be joined in a couple of minutes here by Asar M. Hotep. And Asar M. Hotep is featured in the film uh, Hapi, uh, which deals with the role of economics and development of civilization. And he's going to be here uh, in Detroit for the uh, One Africa Power and Unity Conference that's coming up uh, uh, in Detroit at the Doubletree Hotel uh, Saturday, uh, April 30th and Sunday, uh, May 1st. And I'll be there as well. Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Professor James Small, who we had on the show last night. Professor Small will be here also. Uh, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries, Dr. Jeffries' wife, and many others. Um, so Asar Imhotep is going to, his presentation at the conference is going to be on linguistics as a tool for ancestral memory recovery and intellectual warfare linguistics as a tool for ancestral memory memory recovery uh, and intellectual warfare. We're going to talk about this and talk a little bit about the conference as well. OK, we'll give you information about how you can uh, register for the conference. Then also, as, as I said today, it didn't snow here uh, in Detroit. So that's a good thing, because yesterday, uh, Monday, looked like a blizzard here in Detroit. Um, some of you may have heard Reverend Al Sharpton's radio show today, Keeping It Real, that broadcast right here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. I mean, not 11 p.m., that's when I'm on. Uh, it broadcasts Monday through Friday, um, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Keeping It Real. I called into his radio show today. I usually don't do that, but I called in because uh, some of the to, – to, we were talking about politics and the George Floyd Justice of Policing Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, the um, – uh, also, the Freedom to Vote Act, and I had to correct him on a couple of things because he knew it, but it's just the way he was saying it wasn't um, accurate. So some of you all heard that, and if you heard that, you can give us a call as well. Um, so very interesting. He agreed with everything I had to say also as well. So that's a good thing. Um, and then earlier today at 10.30 a.m., there was a press conference. Let me know when we have a SAR on the phone, please, Shakita. The, er, earlier today, there was a press conference that the uh, family attorneys for Patrick Leoa had. And uh, uh, they had an independent autopsy. And uh, Patrick Leoa killed April 4th, 2022, by a um, Grand Rapids police officer, Grand Rapids, Michigan police officer. And the independent autopsy confirms that what we had been told and pretty much gathered from the video, it confirms that Patrick Leoa was shot in the back of the head and they delivered, they, they revealed some new details uh, today also at the press conference. So um, we're going to share uh, an excerpt of that press conference today and give you an update uh, was taking place in that investigation as well. Now, in the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay, so um, we're going to have uh, Asar M. Hotep on in just a minute. He's featured in the documentary uh, Hapi, The Role of Economics in Development of Civilization. And um, you can visit his uh, website as well, which is uh, asarmhotep.com. But he uh, is a software developer, cultural theorist, and Africana researcher from Houston, Texas, Africana researcher from Houston, Texas, uh, whose research focuses, uh, whose research focus is the cultural, linguistic, and philosophical links between the ancient Egyptian civilizations and modern Bantu, um, and modern Bantu cultures 
of Central and South Africa, modern Bantu cultures of Central and South Africa. You know, we've talked about the Bantu numerous times here, here on this show. He is currently continuing his education in computer science with a concentration in artificial intelligence. We want to welcome to the African History Network show for the first time, but not the last, Asar M. Hotel. How you doing today, brother Hotel? And once okay, again, okay, no problem. And once again, uh, everybody, and we're going to okay. have this information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. The conference is taking place um, Saturday, April 30th uh, through Sunday, May 1st at the Double Tree Hotel, 525 West Lafayette Boulevard in Detroit. Asar M. Hotel, Dr. Linda Jeffries, Professor James Small, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Common. They will be doing a presentation as well. Uh, Dr. Mawulana Karanga will be doing a press. So, so um, we're going to post the link here. You can register for the conference. If you cannot attend in person, you can um, uh, live stream the uh, event. They have a ticket to live stream the event also. So, uh, Brother Sar, uh, it, it, first off, explain yeah. to people what, what is a cultural theorist. You are a cultural theorist and Africana researcher. Explain to people what that is. Yes, um, I have taken it upon myself to really kind of research the the inner depths of psychology of culture. Okay. Uh, looking at the issues of, you know, the the evolution and development of African American people as a result of the transatlantic slave holocaust. Right. And I've come to the conclusion, as well as many other uh, scholars, that you know the cultural issue is one of the biggest issues that we have and and so i've been looking into how to develop culture from scratch what are those basic elements and mm -hmm. just to to theorize and, and, and practice on you know creating and developing and architecting if i can say uh the the elements of culture that we will want to survive in the future to uh, help African American people to thrive. So I look, of course, into African cultures, looking at the spirit and the base of what makes them work, and just cultures around the world, right. what culture is supposed to do, and to to think about uh, and create, you know, uh, models uh, that hopefully we can uh, emulate in the future. And so that's that's what we mean uh, ultimately by. Uh, like a cultural theorist. Okay. Um, and then, of mm -hmm. course, the Africana researcher, I'm a ecologist. So, you know, I study at the African centered, uh, excuse me, uh, an, an African centered study of African history, phenomena, culture, language, uh, psychology, religion, and the like. Okay. So, Afro Africology being a, because different schools, you know, have different. Uh, department. So like at Wayne State, they had an Africana Studies yeah. Department. So when I was in Wayne State back in the early 90s, they had an Africana Studies Department. So I took classes there. You have some some schools that have a Black Studies Department. You have some schools that have Africology. OK, so Africology yeah. is it sounds like it's, it's more precise. The study of African history from an African centered perspective. Is that, is that a correct interpretation of it? Essentially, yes. Okay. So an Afrocentric perspective, um, yeah. uh, the, the, the Africans are subjects of their own reality and, uh, you know, kind of focused on uh, the perspective of the African people themselves as not being acted upon by history, but as actors and shapers and yes. agents of history. Okay, yeah, and, uh, that, and that's more on the line of, of uh, how Dr. Carter G. Woodson perceived history and taught history, especially through uh, his books and through a solid association for the study of uh, Negro life and history, which became association for the study of African American life and history. Um, and, you know, I could, I could tell uh, oh, you about to say something. Go ahead. No, no, I, I was just agreeing. I was saying that you know, I could tell a difference um, in the history classes when I took a I t had to take a medieval history class um, in the uh, out of the history department uh, to fulfill a, a, a requirement, a history requirement at Wayne State. So it was, it was taught by like a white British woman. 
and it was not African centered at all. And I think the only thing they talked about the Moors was Othello by uh, Shakespeare. Okay, the play okay. Othello. Okay, but when I took my Africana studies classes at, at Wayne State's Africana Studies Department, it was you. It was it was a whole different vibe. It, it was much different. Okay, even though it it was a little watered down, it was much different. <laughs> all right. A absolutely. And then when we talk about when we talk about um uh okay, we're coming up on a uh, we're coming up on a break. When we come back from the break, I want you to explain what your presentation is going to be about linguistics as a tool for ancestry memory, recovery and intellectual warfare. So stand by um is stand by sorry. We'll be back in a few minutes. Everybody listen to the African History Network show right here on 9 10 a.m. the Superstation the Future Radio. Our guest is Asar Mhotep, who's a cultural theorist and Africana researcher, no relation to me. We'll be back in a few minutes. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995, and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008, and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, The Business of Beings, was released in December 2021, and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human, were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis' books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. On the African History Network show, we deal with current events of history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, April 19th, 2022. And today was a good day because it did not snow here in Detroit. <laughs> like, <laughs> what a difference a day makes because yesterday looked like a blizzard. Hey, you can uh, support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This, this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, uh, et cetera. We have the information right on the homepage of our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. And uh, we have the link there also, okay? And we're celebrating our 12th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. First broadcast in March 10th, 2010. My first guest was Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who we had, one of my teachers who we had on the show April 4th, uh, 2022. And this is our sixth year anniversary of me broadcasting um, our show here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF, first broadcasted April uh, April of 2016. Okay, I uh, want to welcome back uh, Asar M. Hotel. Okay, so, uh, Brother Asar, you, uh, at the uh, One Africa Power and Unity Conference, your presentation is going to be on linguistics as a tool for ancestry, memory, recovery, and intellectual warfare. So give us a synopsis of what you're going to talk about. Yes. Well, the the conference is titled, you know, uh, One Unity. Yes. And part of the purpose of the conference is to to demonstrate the interconnections between African people mm -hmm. as a foundation, as a, and a basis from which to uh, network and build, you know, a strong cultural and economic system that benefits the continent as well as the diaspora. So from the historical perspective, one of those uh, means of establishing the interconnections between African people is through the language. And what I'll be doing is showing the audience how linguistics is used, historical comparative linguistics is used as a tool to uh, recover the memory of a population 
population of people around the world, but more specifically, of course, we'll be dealing with uh, African people, and I'll be dealing with the ancient Egyptian and Bantu of Central Africa, but also how it can be used as a tool or a weapon, uh, an instrument in intellectual warfare, which is being waged against African people for having the audacity to research and to tell their own story based off the evidence. And so what you have is all of these attacks, which mm -hmm. tries to dislocate and separate, for example, the so-called sub-Saharan Africans from the ancient Egyptians. Right. And <laughs> the, the, the language betrays all of those uh, those those adversaries when they try to make that disconnect. Mm -hmm. And we can show that the Bantu speakers of Central Africa in terms of language and culture is closer than any of the groups who surround the the ancient Egyptians, for example, the Berbers or the Semites or the uh, European, for example, the Greeks or the uh, Hittites or something to that nature, mm -hmm. uh, to the ancient Egyptians or any of those groups. So how is that the case? It is the case because the ancient Egyptians are related to the Bantu-speaking people. And, of course, the the Central African area, Cameroon, the Nigeria, um, you know, Togo, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Namibia, uh, Namibia, I mean, is the areas for which a lot of African Americans have their ancestors. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it has the ability to, to help one to reconstruct parts of the ancestral culture that gave birth to all of these present day living communities. And it is, it is used in order to wage that fight, which tries to separate, um, those Africans uh, who created ancient Egyptian civilization uh, from those in Central Africa okay, and so, West Africa right. uh, in general. Okay, so explain who the Bantu are, because uh, you, you and I talked earlier today, and we were talking, for instance, we were talking about the, the, the film Black Panther, and uh, Isikosa, which is the language spoken in the film Black Panther, is a Bantu language, just like Kiswahili <laughs> is a Bantu language. So explain what is Bantu? All right. Well, Bantu is the label of a language family, mm -hmm. which extends uh, typically from around the southern border of Nigeria, um, at the edge of Cameroon, all the way to, you know, now Somalia in East Africa, mm -hmm. all the way down to uh, Azania or South Africa. And uh, they are, it's a linguistic group. It's not like a genetic group. It's right. not like a, you know, a phenotypic group. It's a, it's a language group um, whose characteristics as a result of the historical comparative method can be shown to be, uh, have been inherited from a, what we call a proto language, uh, the proto Bantu which some argue was in on the border of Nigeria, Cameroon. There are others, although a minority opinion, who argue that they came uh, from around the Great Lakes. Right. But nevertheless, the, the proto-language has a certain amount of lexicon and features and cultural aspects that have diffused and evolved uh, into the, mother, the daughter languages, which we see today, like uh, Chiluba, Kiswahili, Kikongo, mm -hmm. you know, Bata, Isisulu, Isikota, as you uh, mentioned yeah. uh, earlier, uh, and others. Okay. Now, if we look here um, very quickly, so uh, a, a basic, I, I want your input on this here. Um, I have a slide here from my presentations and just a basic. Um, understanding of um uh what bantu is and let me pull this up here okay here we go so bantu is a uh uh bantu languages are a group of some 500 languages 
belonging to the Bantoid subgroup of the Banu Congo branch of the Niger, Niger Congo language family. The Bantu languages are spoken in a large area, including most of uh, Africa from southern Cameroon eastward to Kenya and southward to the southernmost tip of the continent. So you going into a Zania Mawini Mutapa or South Africa, as you were talking about. Um, 12 Bantu languages are spoken by more than 5 million people, including Rundi, Rwanda, Shona, Isi Kosa, or what some people call Kosa, and Amazulu or Zulu, uh, Kiswa, uh, and then Kiswahili, which is spoken by 5 million people as a mother tongue and some 30 million as a second language, is a Bantu lingua franca important in both commerce and literature. Is that pretty much uh, accurate there? Anything you want to add to that or clarify? Yes, for, for the time being, that that um, is it, pretty accurate. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in terms of how, you know, the, the languages are, you know, currently grouped. Right. Um, however, Mm -hmm. I would argue, and there are a few of us who argue this, that, for example, the ancient Egyptian should also be included in the Bantu languages. Okay. And Explain that, you know, if you want to so, explain that. Well, all right, so keep in mind, mm -hmm. in 1963, there was a uh, an anthropologist by the name of Joseph Greenberg. Joseph who, Greenberg. Using a method... Joseph Greenberg. Yes. Okay, Greenberg. Joseph Greenberg. Okay. Who who came up with a categorization schema uh, using a method which we call the vast comparative method. I won't get into the details right. of it, but just know it's a different method than the historical comparative uh, linguistic method. Mask comparative. And with it, that method, spell that M A S comparative. M A S S. M A S S. Okay. Got the Edward Robinson talks about that. Yeah, but go ahead. Go ahead. Mask, mask compared. Yeah. Yep. And so this is it is from him that we get the the language phylum groupings of Niger Congo, Nilo Saharan, uh, Afroasiatic, and Khoisan. Yeah. Now there are other linguists who disagree with those groupings. Okay. And you know, Theophilo Binga, who will also be presenting at the conference. Right. Um in Detroit. Uh Although virtually, um, he came up with a a grouping which he calls Negro Egyptian, Negro or Black Egyptian, Negro Egyptian, Egyptian. Egyptian or Black Negro Egyptian. Egyptian. Okay, all right, exactly. This, this is what we're gonna do. Asar, we're up against a break. When we come back, we're gonna pick up on Negro Egyptian, Black Egyptian. But also, I want you to, when we come back for the break, I want you to explain the connection between the Dogon and Mali. The, the Yoruba and Nigeria and ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt as well. Okay, so we'll, <laughs> stand by. We're coming up on a break. Everybody, listen to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation Future Radio, Future Radio. We're speaking with Asar M. Hotep, who's a cultural theorist and Africana researcher. He'll be one of the presenters at the One Africa Power in Unity Conference taking place in Detroit, April 30th and May 1st at the Double Tree Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry, it's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre, I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time.
STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Nine ten, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on nine ten a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, April nineteenth, twenty twenty two. And it didn't snow today in Detroit. That's a good thing. Uh, be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, we have uh, class number one of uh, my 10-week online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We have class number one starting up Saturday, April 23rd, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do a thousands of years of history. What leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, all of that. Class is regularly $130. is on sale $80. And um, even after the course is over with, you still have full access to the course. You still go back and watch it as many times as you want to. Two years from now, you'll still be able to go back and watch the entire course. Okay, so that's at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And then we have a bundle pack where you can register for both classes because the second class that I teach is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Black Power, 1865 to 1968. That second class we start in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase and also deal with the Haitian Revolution. And we go throughout history um, and we deal with what leads up to the Civil War taking place. We do a Reconstruction, Jim Crow era, um, World War, World War One, World War Two, Great Migration, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement. Okay, so and we have a bundle pack where you, you can register for both classes for one hundred and twenty dollars. Okay, so um, on the line we have uh, Brother Sar Mhotep, who's a cultural theorist and African researcher, and he's going to be one of the uh, African Center scholars presenting at um, the One Africa Power and Unity Conference, taking place uh, Saturday, April thirtieth, and uh, Sunday, May 1st at the Double Tree Hotel here in Detroit. So, uh, uh, sorry, right before the break, you were talking about uh, uh, Negro Egyptians. Uh, talk about that, and, and you were talking about Theophil Obinga. Yes. In 1993, Theophil Obinga uh, wrote a text uh, in French on the relationship between ancient Egypt and quote unquote black African languages, mainly dealing with his native language, Bochi, and ancient Egyptian, with supporting evidence of other languages. What, what was his native African language? Languages. What was his native language? In Bochi. In Bochi, okay. And can you spell right. that for us? Can you spell that for uh, the audience? Please? The Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen it spelled a number of ways, but it's going to be M as in Mary, B e as in boy, O as in orange. Uh, C as in car, H as in Harold, and then I as in iPod. Okay. So in Bochi. Okay. Right. And um, so when he analyzed, remember before I was saying that Joseph Greenberg created uh, four language groups, mm -hmm. Nalo Sahara, Niger Congo, uh, Afro-Asiatic, and Khoisan. Well, Binger comes back and looks at uh, Joseph Greenberg's work is not impressed, um, and he analyzed the data, and then he came up with Negro Egyptian, which in, um, which includes all of the languages mentioned, with the exception of Khoisan. He too separates Khoisan from Negro Egyptian, um, but he takes the Semitic languages out of Afroasiatic. Gets rid of Afroasiatic, but includes all of that into Khoisan and, and the Berber language is its own language family, according to uh, Theophilo Bingham. And so uh, there was another linguist by the name of Jean-Claude Mboli, who uh, published a, a text also in French in 2010, The Origin of African Languages, and he furthers uh, Dr. Obinga's work and uh, further establishes the Negro-Egyptian and 
but in his analysis, he came to discover that the Bantu languages are closer to the mother language, which gave birth to the daughter languages. And so this is why, uh, and, and he was able to, just like uh, Dale Falabinga did, show that the ancient Egyptian and the Bantu languages are, are closely related languages that belong to the same family. And so when we, when we look at the ancient Egyptian and Bantu, there is a reason why, for example, this uh, Egyptologist, this European Egyptologist by the name of uh, Jean Spinara, made the, made the uh, argument that, you know, to, to understand ancient Egyptian religion and philosophy, it is best to to consult the the readings of Olga Tameli, in other words, the Dogon. The Dogon, and, yes. Conversations uh, with Olga Tameli. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yep. I remember and, that from college. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, man. <laughs> and and that to philosophy. Right. And the reason why you you know he, you would consult Bantu philosophy and Dogon philosophy is because that it's essentially the same mm-hmm. when when you're talking about the ancient Egyptian. And so when you ask the other question about what is the relationship between the Dogon and of Mali and the Yoruba of of Nigeria and the ancient Egyptians, they all descend from this ancestral culture, which we call Negro Egyptian, which I which I personally call Chin and Hintu, uh, for for reasons beyond the, the scope of this conversation, but okay. uh, Negro Egyptian, nonetheless, uh, is is the mother culture and the mother tongue, and much of this philosophy, much of these thoughts and and ideas already existed then, however old it was, and this is why you see these commonalities between. The, the Dogon, the Yoruba, and uh, the ancient Egyptian, as well as the, the, the Congo and Central Africa and the Zulu and South Africa, et cetera. Okay, now you said, what, what was it? Was it Ichi? What was the name that you uh, called it? Uh, the, the language group I call is China Into, meaning the Into family. Okay. And and the reason and the simple reason without too much explanation is that it, it, again as I stated, mm-hmm. the bad two languages are closest to the mother tongue. Mm-hmm. The mother tongue is is more so like a Bantu language. So that's why I call it the into language. It's like all of it is into. Whether right. you're talking about Dogon, whether you're talking about Yoruba, whether you're talking about ancient Egyptian or whatnot. Mm-hmm. The modern Bantu languages are just a type of Bantu language. Okay. Just like Egyptian is a type of Bantu language, but they all belong to the Bantu universe, the family of Bantu. So that's what China Bantu. Okay. Can, can you spell that for the audience? China Bantu. Can you spell that for us, please? Yes. It's going to be C Y as in yellow, E as in Eric. N is in Nancy, A is an apple, and then you could put a dash. Okay. And then put N is in Nancy, T is in Terrence, U as in up. U as in up. So okay. Chiena into. Chiena into. Okay. Now you talked about Bantu being closer to the mother language. What is the mother language? The Apollo Bingo calls it Negro Egyptian. Okay, Negro Egyptian. And I call it Chin and Into. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. And, and the reason why I call it Chin and Into as, as, as opposed to Negro Egyptian mm-hmm. is that when we say Negro Egyptian, uh, first of all, uh, a lot of people get confused with the Egyptian language. And, okay. and people assume that the Egyptian language is the mother language of all the other languages, and that's not the case. Okay. Um, and then secondly, you know, this is from a scientific perspective, you know, Theophilo Bingo was fighting against the racism that was inherent in the linguistic world mm-hmm. and, and how they were trying to say that Caucasians and, and others coming out of Asia were the mothers and fathers of Egyptian civilization. Right. So he countered that, although his groupings is based on, you know, the, the scientific linguistic evidence, the labeling was political. 
And so this is why it's Negro. You know, he's he's a French speaker, so that's just a it, it doesn't mean it doesn't have the same connotation like here in the United right, States. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's just simply black. Right. And so we want to get out of the racial nomenclature. Mm-hmm. And so I renamed the language family Chenna into. Okay. So that, you know, it has a, a, a basis more so in, 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 in the African context more so than, you know, uh, Negro Egyptian. Okay. Uh, we're coming up here on the break. Uh, you got, you got like about 10 more minutes, uh, about 10 more minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so cause we'll hold you over on the break. Um, very quickly, what is, we talked about Berber and, and the term Berber can be very confusing. What, what is Berber? Who are the Berbers? Well, the, the Berbers are a North African people mm-hmm. who occupied territories stretching from Libya to Morocco. Right. And, you know, they, they're they kind of, you know, been interbred for a number of, you know, for they've been there for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And if you talk to, like, Shumaka Keita, what uh, they hold markers, uh, genetic markers, that is, that, that, that groundly place them in North Africa and, and not other places, although they've been admixed, you know, for a long time. Right. So, but they speak a language that is, that we call Berber, and you know, under Joseph Greenberg's classification, it would belong to the Afro-Asiatic family. But under Negro Egyptian, it would it would be its own language family. Right now, when you read, uh, I think it's in Golden Age of the Moor, and I have the book up right here, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, has a number of essays in here. Dr. Jose Clemente Bay, uh, Renoko Rashidi, who's an ancestor now, we know he passed away August 2nd, 2021, and others, uh, Dr. Wayne Chandler. They talk about how, uh, at one point, the Arabs called the Moors Berbers. Okay, are you, fam- are you familiar with that? Yes, okay. All right, because because I think at different times, the term Berber could mean like different people, so to speak. It's kind of a, a confusing term, uh, Berbers. And a lot of these terms are designed to confuse people like more that, you know, more becomes synonymous with Muslim. Muslim becomes synonymous with Arabs. The Moors get depicted in movies yeah. and things like this as Europeans. Right. <laughs> when the, the majority of the Moors were African people, the majority of them were, you know, African people. So, okay, uh, 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 we'll, we'll pick this up on the other side of the break because I want to talk about the Dogon, Yoruba, and ancient chemists. Stand by. All right, everybody, yeah. you listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. We're speaking with Asar M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One, they solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property. And two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing costs, which can be thousands of dollars, They close on a date of the seller's choosing and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing. They take the property in an as-is condition and the seller is not required to make any repairs. Give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs. Call them at 973-475-8488. That's 973-475-8488. Visit their website, AbundantCapitalGroup.com. That's AbundantCapitalGroup.com. And email them at ACG at AbundantCapitalGroup.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Abundant Capital Group iRedify is a black-owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read eBooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally 
Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Welcome back to the African History Network show. All right, we're speaking with uh, Asar M. Hotep, who's a cultural theorist and Africana researcher. Um, okay, uh, brother, right before right before the break, I said when we come back, we want to talk about uh, the Dogon of uh, Mali and Burkina Faso and Yoruba in Nigeria. Um, I've come across information over the years that talks about how they were originally in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, now that a region of Africa. And then also there's a good article from facetofaceafrica.com that deals with, it's called uh, the Dogon tribe of Mali discovered this invisible uh, star centuries before Galileo invented the telescope. And we know the Dogon, the master uh, astronomers, and according to their oral tradition, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. According to their oral tradition, they say they come from the Sirius, uh, you know, Sirius stars, the Sirius A, Sirius B star system. But the Dogon, the Dogon tribe possesses a rich oral history and knowledge of astronomy, and this dates as far back as 3,200 BC, according to their oral literature of the Dogon tribe. The star named Sirius A, the brightest star in the night sky with the bluish tinge, has an invisible companion star scientists have named Sirius B. This companion star is not only visible to the naked eye. It, it, this, this companion star is not only visible to the naked eye, but also completes a trip around Sirius A every 50 years. So talk about so talk about the, the relationship between the Dogon uh, and the, uh, the uh, Yoruba and ancient Kemet. Yes. Um, well, they are, you know, different. Mm, yes. That uh, emerged out of the Green Sahara. Okay. Be before it became a desert, the Green Sahara before it became a desert. Exactly. Okay. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a result of the monsoons that used to come all the way up to the edge of North Africa before the drying, uh, the melting of the uh, glaciers coming from the um, the Ice Age mm -hmm. uh, in, in Europe. So that, that process dried up all the moisture, uh, excuse me, it, it sucked up all the moisture and the the monsoon rains coming out of the Indian Ocean no longer went all the way up into North Africa. Thus, the uh, the Sahara became a you know uh, a desert again, and it began pushing the inhabitants out. And and so uh, many of them went into you know trying to find large river sources. So of course many of them went into the Nile uh, Valley. And you know, settled amongst the Nile, either in Sudan or into uh, what we now call Egypt. Others, you know, went further down into Chad and Nigeria. You know, hitting Lake Chad or hitting the Niger River, and and others, you know, went further uh, west, like the Bande people and the like. And so, when you talk about the Dogon, the Dogon basically are a branch of like the Bande people. And they are, you know, kind of close cousins with the Jagera. Uh -huh. So, like, if you, you ever heard of mm -hmm. uh, the late Al Ancestor, yeah. Maladoma Somme. Maladoma and Somme. Somme. I met him. You know, yep, I met him years ago at Wayne yeah. State University. Yep. Water and Spirit. Yep. Water and Spirit. And then yes, he, water and his, spirit. And we and his, he and his wife had a, a, a follow-up book called We Have No Word for Sex also. Yes. Yep. Patrice, exactly. Patrice Maladoma. Yes, yeah, and, and the spirit of intimacy. The spirit of intimacy was another one I heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so they they all that that's all kind of the same uh, grouping of, of, of people, um, even though different languages, but they right. they they emerge out of the same ancestral culture. Okay. And so these these you know groups of you know what we would call Negro Egyptian speakers. And many of the ideas that they have that are shared are ancestral. Some may be a result of interactions at very uh, distant times, 
you know, probably even before Pharaonic times during the Great Sahara period. But they are all three different groups are really kind of known for different things. Okay. And, you know, we 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 know of course of the Dogon and their their you know, their religious, their astronomical aspects and but this is where it gets kind of confused because a lot of people you know haven't read uh the pale fox yeah and so when you read the pale fox it doesn't necessarily say that they knew and understood a you know a serious beat that was actually another author who made that argument for which everybody is arguing but the discussion about Sirius and the like comes from the pale fox. Mm-hmm. But they don't they don't mention in the pale fox that you know that was anything really significant in terms of a companion star and that it was Sirius V. And so you know we have to be kind of careful with that and and the way that you know we we word that and and, and make sure that we're citing the uh, the the text correctly. Uh, when it comes to that that particular conversation, but Sirius, you know, just a regular Sirius is a very important Series uh, star because during its heliacal rising, mm-hmm. it signals the coming of the monster race. Right. You know, you're talking about Sirius um, A. Sirius it, A. I'm sorry. You're talking about Sirius yeah, A. Correct. Yeah, yeah. The, so that that would be correct. That would be the star in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. Canis Major, the big mm-hmm. dog, Sirius A, the star in the east that the that the wise man in the story is said they followed the star in the east but went west. But but that's that's another <laughs> that's another conversation. All right, look, we're out of time here. Let people know how they can follow you on social media. Give people your website. Yes, uh, you can go to atharimhotep.com and you know I'm on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and of course Facebook. So. Just type it in a saw and hotel. Okay. Uh, should bring me up on all those platforms. All right, brother. Well, look, I'll see you in Detroit, man. And thanks for coming on. Okay. You have a good night. Okay. All right. I brother. appreciate you for having me. All right. Hotel. Be blessed, be blessed. All right. Peace. All right. Hotel. Hotel. All right. Uh, A-S-A-R-I-M-H-O-T-E-P uh, com. Okay, those watching on Facebook and YouTube Keep watching for a few more minutes We're going to keep going We're going to uh, deal with what happened today at the press conference Dealing with the killing of um, uh, Patrick Leota By Grand Rapids Police Officer uh, Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com You can register for my online classes there Also, you can support the African History Network Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App and the, through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Remember, right now it's correct, wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We'll kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right, stand by, everybody. Okay. Uh, let's go to let's go to this next story here. And this is dealing with um the what happened today at the uh press conference. Um, dealing with the killing of uh, Patrick Leota. Okay, uh, so you know we've been talking about this here on this show. He was a uh, Cameroon. Uh, it was a uh, uh, Congo refugee. Okay, a uh, Congo refugee, twenty six years old, killed by um, Grand Rapids police officer, white a white Grand Rapids police officer, uh, April fourth. And it was a minor traffic stop regarding a uh, the officer said that he uh, he had the wrong license plate on the on his vehicle. OK. And he ended up uh, the, the officer tried to use his taser on him when he's walking away, he tried to use his, his taser. He didn't give a warning and say, don't move or I'll tase you or something like that. Uh, Patrick, uh, there's a struggle over the taser. And the officer is on top of Patrick. Patrick's on the stomach, uh, and the officer pulls out his uh, pulls out his gun, his uh, handgun, and shoots Patrick in the back of the head, point blank range. So, uh, New York Times has this article here. Autopsy shows officer shot black man in back of head. Family lawyers say Patrick Leoa, twenty six was killed on April 4th by a Grand Rapids police officer during a traffic stop. The police re- released videos 
of the shooting last week drawing protests. So there was about five nights of protests um, over this. And um, I want to go to, let me see, which one is this here? Uh, I want to go to. I want to pull up this piece from uh, NBC News and because they have an update and they have a clip of what happened at the press conference today also. So uh, attorneys uh, Ben Crump and Vin Johnson, Vin, uh, uh, Vin Johnson is known here in the Detroit area. They held a press conference along with the uh, uh, person who conducted the independent autopsy uh, to give an update. So uh, lawyers for the family of Patrick Leoa, a black man shot dead by a white police officer in Grand Rapids, Michigan, said on Tuesday that a private autopsy showed he was fatally shot in the back of the head by the officer after a struggle during a traffic stop. At a news conference uh, on Tuesday, Dr. Uh, Werner, the forensic pathologist, who performed the autopsy said uh, said the bullet went through uh, Patrick Leota's skull when he was not on April 4th. The bullet went through his skull. Okay, now the uh, there's no question what killed this young man, Dr. Warner Spitz uh, said. The pathologist whose experience includes high profile investigations such as uh, the assassinations of President John F. Kennedy and uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said the only injury on Patrick Leota's body was the bullet wound. The only injury on Patrick Leota's, Leota's body was the bullet wound. Reading the which which implies that Patrick didn't hit the officer, you know, he didn't have like skint knuckles, things like this. All right. Uh, and one of the things they they pointed out here in the uh, press conference today is that Patrick didn't try to hit the officer or anything like this. He was trying to get away. OK, so we'll go to the clip here in just a minute. Reading the autopsy. Attorney Benjamin Crump, who's an attorney for the family, said that Patrick Leota was conscious and aware that a gun was being held to his head. Conscious and aware that a gun was being held to his head. Uh, the fragmentation at the entrance wound of Patrick's skull suggested that the firing of the gun was a contact shot. Uh, Mr. Crump said, meaning the gun was pressed to his head, meaning the gun was pressed to his head. Death was instantaneous uh, when the gun was fired. OK, uh, Benjamin Crump, that is now scientific evidence of this tragic killing in what his family believes was an ex execution and what his family believes was an execution. Now, another attorney, Vin Johnson, who's known here in the uh, metro Detroit area, and Vin, and Vin Johnson is a white attorney. Uh, Vin Johnson said that uh, Patrick Leo, Leo, Leo's family wanted to seek justice through the court system. The Grand Rapids police did not immediately respond to requests. Comment. In a statement on Tuesday, the Michigan State Police, uh, who are conducting the investigation, said the shooting was still being quote we, we remain committed to conducting a thorough and complete investigation which will be turned over to the kent county prosecutor when complete so kent county is the michigan county that grand rapids uh michigan is in okay now the killing of uh patrick leoa uh drew protests last week after the police released video showing the traffic stop that ended in his death and strained longstanding tensions with the police in Grand Rapids, a city of about 200,000 uh, people where 18% of the residents are African-American. Okay, now I want to go to the uh, 
clip here. This deals with the press conference today. An autopsy report has just been released for the unarmed black man who was shot and killed by an officer in Michigan. That autopsy was commissioned by the family of the victim. And video of the April 4th shooting appears to show Patrick Loyola running from police, then being tackled by an officer there on your screen and struggling over his taser. NBC News' Shaquille Brewster is monitoring those developments for us. Shaq, what exactly did this autopsy find? Yeah, Morgan, let me quickly set it up by saying that this is the autopsy that's commissioned by the family. This is not from the medical examiner. This is not the first autopsy that was done. But the autopsy commissioned by the family attorney showed that Patrick Leoya was shot in the back of a in the back of his head with that single shot by the Grand Rapids Police Department. Off that autopsy uh, is still being presented right now. The uh, the forensic pathologist is still going through his findings, but the big headline from it is that they say that he was shot in the back of the head. All that we knew to this point was that he was shot in the head, Morgan. And Jack, I mean, how is the family responding? I know you made it clear that this is their autopsy. How are they responding to the video, to the outrage, to, to this autopsy? Yeah, I spoke with them yesterday and you heard from his parents saying that they were devastated, that they were heartbroken. His mother told me that she misses his presence and his voice, uh, they were not at this press conference as this was being presented by uh, the forensic pathologist, by the way, the pathologist that did the autopsy of NLK, that did the autopsy of JFK, that was also involved in Michael Jackson's autopsy. Uh, they were not there and present for this. And I believe we actually have some sound from that press conference. I want you to play a little bit of it. And it gives you a sense of why the family wasn't there for these details that were being uh, announced. Based on scientific evidence, we can confirm that Patrick Eola was shot in the back of his head. That is now scientific evidence of this tragic killing and what his family believes was an execution. You heard Ben Crump use that word execution. That's the same word that the family used with me last week. The demands that they have right now, and this is consistent from my conversations with them even last week and what you've heard through the weekend, is they want the officer that fired that fatal shot. They want him publicly identified. They say that's important for their grieving process. They want that officer to then be fired and prosecuted. We do know that Patrick Leoya, Leoya excuse me, he will have his funeral service on Friday, Morgan. Oh, just a sad situation all around. Shaquille Brewster for us. Shaq, thank you. Okay, so that was a clip of that was a clip of today, and that's uh, from NBC News. Okay, um, NBC News also has uh, this article here. Uh, Independent autopsy confirms Patrick Leo was shot in back of head by Grand Rapids police. That's from uh, April 19th, 2022. Okay. Now, I want to go to uh, WXYZ. WXYZ broadcasted the press conference live. I'm going to share uh, an excerpt of uh, the press conference that happened today. Okay. So let's go to that. Just a second here. Let's get that queued up. All right. Okay. Let's turn the volume. And I want to thank Sarah Lucrecio uh, for helping us put all this together. But we want to start off with updates. We told the Yola family that we would be intentional and very intense in investigating every aspect of how this Grand Rapids police officer escalated a simple misdemeanor traffic stop into a deadly execution with him shooting an unarmed civilian in the back of his head. The autopsy findings from the independent autopsy 
performed by Dr. Spitz is going to get into very graphic details about just how horrific his killing was in a scientific manner. And we will have scientific evidence of not only the entry and the trajectory, but how the bullet traveled, where it ended up, which I think are very important to Attorney Johnson and I as we try to make good on our word to the family that we're going to investigate every aspect of this case and get to the truth. So in doing that, we believe it's important that you take everything in context. When you look at the video that was released by the Grand Rapids Police Department, and you don't have to take Ben Johnson's word for it. You don't have to take Ben Crump's word for it. Look at it with your own eyes. You would notice that the police officer initially is not traveling in the same direction of Patrick. So what we see is him make a U-turn to get behind Patrick. As my investigator Cliff Jones and I uh, were reviewing the video over and over again, we both acknowledge that we have to investigate whether this is a classic DWB case, a driving while black case, that he profiled this black motorist and turned his car around because when he turns the car around, what you see is Patrick's car is about a block and a half away from him. And then all of a sudden, you see the lights on and you have to ask yourself, how did he know that Patrick tag registration wasn't valid, but he's coming from the opposite direction. These are things that Attorney Johnson and I want to investigate intensely because it goes to the mentality of that police officer and it goes to the culture that was manifest in that police department at least as it pertained to this particular officer in these instances. The second thing we certainly want to look at is the aspects, and Attorney Johnson is going to talk about this, of his body camera video. We want to investigate that thoroughly as well. And obviously, it is really going to be about use of force that we're going to talk about uh, for the brunt of our time today with the autopsy and how Dr. Spitz arrived at his preliminary conclusions. And then, certainly, we will look at the aspects of how necessary this was when you look at the video and you hear the results of the autopsy. Just another senseless killing of an unarmed black person in America by the very individual who was supposed to protect him. And so we, we won't belabor the point. We're going to get to the autopsy and find this after uh, my great co-counsel talks to you about those things we promised to the Yoli family about investigating intensely every aspect. And he's going to introduce uh, an incredible doctor who is very thorough 
and doing this independent autopsy. So I give you to uh, a person you all know very well here in Detroit, Attorney Ben Johnson. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. It uh, saddens me that we're here today in the very room where just a few years ago, pre-COVID, my firm and I celebrated with many folks in the legal community Detroit for our holiday party. And when I think about that night and think about coming in here today and what it is we're having to talk about, it, to tell you the truth, makes me sick to my stomach. But we appreciate you being here. And I want to explain about the review process that Ben Crump just told you about. We don't have all the video. You know that. We have what you all have. So obviously doing this type of work for uh, Ben and I for over 30 some years each, you review it, we see more and more each time. Mr. Crump, as his co-counsels charged me with reviewing and hiring experts. And we're very fortunate because as many of you in the room know, I've done this type of work for a long time and I think we have access to and we know some of the foremost experts in a number of different areas. One of the experts, who well, I'm not gonna name yet, but we've retained him, he's a police policies and procedure expert who testifies, who teaches uh, police policies and procedures to the police all across the United States. And he also serves as an expert, sometimes uh, on behalf of the plaintiff, sometimes on behalf of the defense. And we've already retained him, and he has certainly shared with us his initial opinions. The two that I'm going to mention very briefly before I introduce, again, someone who doesn't need to be introduced to this room, Dr. Werner Spitz, one of the foremost forensic pathologists in the world is the body cam that many of you keep asking Ben and I about, and I wanna respond directly. Folks, we haven't seen the body cam yet, but we're gonna. In a civil case, when we get up and filing, we will ask for the body cam. Mr. Crump and I are in the process of sending a, a letter, we call it a spoliation letter to the city of Grand Rapids. They know what's coming, keep all the evidence, and they will, and the Michigan State Police will as well because they're gonna look at the body cam. People ask us every day, right Ben? They say, hey, tell us how the body cam could turn off at a struggle. And the answer is again, knowing straight up, I haven't seen it yet. And part of my job, Mr. Crump's job, will be look at the body cam and, and actually touch it ourselves, okay? But I'm gonna refer you all back, because a number of you were in the room with the, mayor, with the chief of police, on that Friday, Lauren, I see you, Bob Hicks, I saw you right on the film. And he admitted something to you that I hope you all got. In order to turn this body cam off, the button needs to be depressed for three seconds. Three seconds. Tell me how, in a struggle, struggle, while he's on top of our client, our client is face down on the ground, that body cam can be depressed right on that one spot for three seconds. And we also know later on, it gets turned back on. So I know what that suggests to me. You all are smart people, you can figure it out on your own. But again, that's one of the things we'll be looking at. Can I prove it with 100%? Certain the answer is no. But it's certainly important information that we now know since we've reviewed this material over and over again. Next, Mr. Crump has asked me, told me, in this case, in every civil case, ladies and gentlemen, this is called a wrongful death, police misconduct, excessive force, civil rights, call it whatever you want. It goes by all those names and more. But in every single civil case like this, the burden of proof is on these two. And Ms. Hatchett, and Maddie Sinkovich is in the back of the room. I want to thank them and, uh, for being here and their entire team, Liza Dodson and, and Marie Reyna, Danielle Asper, thank you, Chris Desmond. So we have the burden of proof. So folks say, well, Ben, haven't they done an autopsy? Answer, yes. The Kent County Medical Examiner has done an autopsy. And I'm here to tell you something that I think you know, I hope you know, they knew Patrick died that day the second they saw his body of a gunshot wound to the head. 
But it's not just the examination that Dr. Spitz will share with you about. They obviously also do a toxicology study where they run studies on the blood because they want to see whether there's alcohol, drugs, et cetera, in the system. Dr. Spitz did not do a toxicology exam because by the time, obviously, he was given access to Patrick's body, those days were long over, and I won't get more graphic than that. We don't have that report yet. We're in the process of asking for that report, and we'll see whether we get it or whether we get the excuse that they're only gonna give it to the Michigan State Police. We'll update you about that later. But so why an independent autopsy? And the answer is we don't know for sure, other than we know Patrick died of a, a gunshot wound to the head. We know that that's gonna be the conclusion of the uh, Kent County Medical Examiner. But as you all may know, Patrick and his, uh, and his family have a funeral on Friday. So our opportunity to have our expert of our choosing to do an autopsy obviously closes pretty quickly. So when Ben Crump asked me, Ben, I don't want you just to hire one of the best forensic pathologists in the country. I want you hiring two. So I did. Didn't have to look very far. Dr. Werner Spitz is by far, I believe, the most foremost renowned forensic pathologist in our country. And by the way, believe it or not guys, our world. And you'll hear that from other experts. We also hired Dr. Michael Bodden, B as in boy, A-D-E-N. Many of you know Dr. Bodden's name as well. Much like Dr. Spitz, Dr. Bodden has been all over in the biggest cases that I'll share with you a couple about from Dr. Spitz. Dr. Michael Bodden is from New York, and Dr. Bodden agreed with me and Ben that when Dr. Spitz said he was available to do the independent autopsy, no reason for Dr. Bodden to come to Michigan to do the same thing to Dr. Vernon Spitz, who's probably done more autopsies than Dr. Bodden. Uh, but again, Dr. Bodden's done a lot too. So we've had two of those folks already involved in this case because it is our burden of proof to prove to a civil jury what killed Patrick. So a lot of folks don't get that in the background. They wonder why we do this. That's why. Dr. Spitz, as, as those of you that are from our area know, he has been doing this type of work for longer than actually I've been alive. And I've had the pleasure of using Dr. Spitz as an expert in these types of cases and others. I've had the displeasure of having him be the expert on the other side. So obviously I want him on my team. Dr. Spitz was, uh, as many of you know, was involved in, in the investigation of uh, President Kennedy, of Martin Luther King, and jumping forward into the more of the recent past, in the O.J. Simpson criminal case, Casey Anthony criminal case, Michael Jackson, I believe criminal and civil case, I believe, and many, many, many more. Dr. Spitz is board certified in not just forensic pathology, you all know, I hope, forensic pathology is the study of exactly how someone dies, if you will, but especially by trauma. He's also board certified in other areas that will become more important as part of the civil case. So when we called up Dr. Spitz last week, we retained him and thanks to uh, Diana Lucky, his assistant, he went to Grand Rapids and did an independent autopsy at the Gillespie Funeral Home in Grand Rapids. And again, that's standard protocol for a situation like this. Dr. Spitz then uh, did a, a preliminary investigation. He shared his initial thoughts with us. And uh, even before it started, Ben Crump said, we need to share so that everybody knows, because you all are calling and more power to you. We appreciate, obviously you want to know the science and we brought you the scientists to talk about that. So Dr. Spitz has some drawings. I'm gonna turn it back over to Mr. Crump. He brought a model to show you the significant part 
of his findings and why. And before we talk about that, you all know, because you've covered criminal cases like this, civil cases like this, this is said and done with the utmost respect for Patrick and his family. God forbid that any one of us in this room ever would have to listen to someone describe what Dr. Spitz asked him. So I just wanted to give a shout out, obviously, to our clients. And I turn it, thank you, Mr. Crump, back to Ben. Thank you very much, Attorney Johnson. Um, before we have Dr. Spitz go into the details of his autopsy, we would uh, put it in context. We want to show the video, uh, if we could, uh, Sarah. Um, on the table, then. Okay, thank you. Ben, I yes, sir. Uh, can you turn up the volume and, and play the video for us? Oh, we don't have volume. Okay. Uh, if we just play the video, uh, start from the beginning. Obviously, the video taken by the passenger. What, what we think is so very significant is at the point when he takes out his head, look where his head is at the shot. And this is going to line up with uh, Dr. Spitz's autopsy findings. Then I believe he has his hand on his Patrick's head. Patrick is lifted away from him, head practically on the ground. And he then takes his gun and flips it on his head well, as you were here from the top. Head turned into the right, I'm uh, sorry, to the left with the right hand, and he shoots into his head in the trajectory goes from the back to the right part of the brain. Uh, and we only wanted to show you the video. Hey, we don't have sound for you. Our apologies because, but you all have uh, great technology. Go back and look at it as we look at it frame by frame, and you will see right the second, the millisecond, the, the nanosecond that he shoots him. He has his hand on his head, pushing it into the ground. He is in complete control of Patrick at that point. Both of his knees uh, have him prone uh, to the ground where he has control of him. And, and as uh, Mr. Jones and Mr. Johnson and I were talking, common sense would tell you if you didn't have control, you would not remove your dominant hand. He feels in such control that he move, removes his dominant hand to take his gun out with ease, seems like, and then to put it in the back of Patrick's head. And so uh, we're going to let Dr. Spitz go, and then at some point he's going to come to the podium and show you the model uh, of the skull and the trajectory that you can see very clearly what happened. All right, we're going to pause it right there. Okay, you can check out the rest of that. That's from uh, WXYZ Channel 7. But a lot of news outlets covered that and have it on their uh, website as well. That's the... Uh, uh, autopsy uh, press conference that took place today dealing with the uh, police killing of Patrick Leoa. Okay, look, um, we have to get out of here. Remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. And uh, you can support the African History Network through Cash App and PayPal. And be sure to uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for my online classes. Uh, class number one of Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school, starts up Saturday, April 23rd. If you've taken any, any of my online courses in the past, you get a 50% discount on these classes and on the bundle pack. So email me at AHN show at African history network.com. All right. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. 
Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995 and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008 and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, The Business of Beings, was released in December 2021 and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human, were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis' books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry, it's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre, I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. iRedify is a Black-owned digital platform that showcases Black and Brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read ebooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iredify.com. Sign up for your membership today. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. 
The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent 